Hello and welcome to Politics on Sunday. My name is Femi Akonde. Today we'll continue our conversation on democracy, uh, the rule of law, and good governance. Our guest today is the presidential candidate of Accord Party, Professor Christopher Emomolen. Welcome to the program, sir. Yeah, thank you, Femi. Yes, so. uh, you were one of the candidates um, that recently signed the peace accord. Uh, but my question is, how significant is this um, document that you and other presidential candidates signed? How is it binding on you to ensure that indeed uh, there is um, decorum in the political space in the build-up to the election? Uh, yeah, it's, um, it's very important that candidates running for political office come together to agree to the terms of engagement um, when it comes to election. Yeah. You know, we've seen in time past how election has been conducted and how candidates conduct themselves in yeah. violating um, electoral rules and guidelines. Yeah. So signing a peace accord, you know, f right from the presidency down to every candidate that is vying for political, it's a sign of commitment to the legal framework for Nigerian electoral processes. It's yeah. a commitment to show that, yes, you are ready to um, go through the process the way it ought to go through. You are ready to accept the outcome of the results. You are ready to do um, everything in line with the electoral laws. Mm -hmm. And that, that to a large extent um, shows that candidates should be responsible for their action. Mm -hmm. Candidates will be held responsible, not just for their action alone, even for action of those that are supporting them. Mm -hmm. They should be accountable to ensuring that those supporting them are also tamed to ensuring that you know there is no violation of every, any you know down from the social media to the reality you know we can also we already see what is happening on the social media and okay. words like um, harsh words insultive words you know there shouldn't be war because we are trying to run a nation if we say that uh, we want to solve the problem of Nigeria then we should exhibit such um, attitude we should be able to control those who support us to so making them know that. Um, we should engage in issue-based um, discussion rather than attacking personality because you want to get a vote. Mm. You are taking a shot at the top job, the highest uh, job in the country. And it's not uh, an easy job. They say an easy lies the head that wears the crown. We have seen how uh, President Muhammad Buhari has been under immense pressure in running the affairs of the country. What has prepared you for this uh, job if you get elected? Yeah, you know, for me, I've been more like an, a social entrepreneur. I've mm -hmm. been out there for the past 15 years, with or without politics. I've been impacting mm -hmm. my world. I've been impacting Nigerians, every look and cranny. The small structures that we have developed are from the charity we've been doing, from education down to women's support to mm -hmm. rural electrification. I've been doing that privately mm -hmm. to tune of empowering thousands of people. That is the JPTS. Yes, yes, that is, yes, yes that is the scholarship platform. So what we do is for the past 15 years is to identify economic challenges and see how we can privately solve them. And that today I've galvanized into mm. a very huge potentiality for us. And I think that is the experience that is needed. Many persons would ask that you don't have experience for government, but mm. we need to have experience for the people, you know, because it is the people that we are going to be governed, not, you know, these are the people, so we must be people-oriented. Yeah. So for me, I'm a people-oriented um, personality, yeah. and that's more of what we are bringing in. And apart from that, value and passion. Yeah. We have got into a stage where we need a leader that has value, who have not, who will not just speak it, who have demonstrated it in service. That is what we are going to bring in. Yeah. And uh, you know, talking about um, the people, you, you and some other candidates we've seen going around visiting uh, former uh, leaders of the country. We have also seen pictures of you and former President Olusha Obasanjo. And people are beginning to ask questions, why these kind of visits? It's, you're not just, you know, almost all presidential candidates have gone around the country uh, meeting with these past leaders. And does the country really belong to them, or is it the people that should matter now? No, um, what actually happened is we do not, or we should not see ourselves as enemy, even those who have led us before. Many of them, even if... Um, there is a lot of blame being thrown at them, not being able to solve some challenges. That should not again make us enemy. Mm -hmm. Yes, I might not buy some of the ideology, but the truth is this, they are not my enemy. So what we do, or what I do, let me talk for myself, is to go in and listen to how they were not able to solve some of the problem, mm -hmm. how they were not able to tackle, how they were able to tackle this. We need to learn from even those we perceive have not done so well. 
Yes, learning process is what will help us to become a better leader rather than castigating those people would say had failed. You can even learn from people that people have visited who had failed. If you're going to pick up a job um, of a presidency, it's, it's very important you also talk to other presidency. Not because you want to govern like them, but because you want to do better than them. Yes, we are in this position. We are in for this job because we know there's a problem. Those who have governed us in the past have tried their best, but their best have not been enough to rescue Nigeria. And if I'm coming in to do better, uh, so I need to study where they have not done well, where they've done well, and get the job done best. So from your own perspective, what is the biggest problem confronting Nigerians today? The biggest confronting Nigeria is that we run a country without a system. And many leaders will not tell you this. Any nation, any organization that runs without a system is doomed for failure. You know, today we live in a country where even Nigerians do not know if they are Nigerians. Anybody can become a Nigeria. You know, you cannot checkmate security, you cannot provide employment, you cannot solve your problem if you don't have bedrock data. Anybody, anybody can even pick a Nigerian passport. Anybody, you look at the porous border. These are because we don't have a system. The first thing I will be doing beyond fighting insecurity, beyond ensuring that we reduce economic hardship, mm -hmm. is to create a system for Nigeria. So Nigeria can be database, Nigeria can be monitored, Nigeria can be known. We need to know ourselves. Today, what is the purpose of picking a passport? What is the purpose of identifying a Nigerian? If you have a family and you don't know your children, anybody can become your children, then you are, you are in a big mess. From 1960, we have those who have tried their best, but the truth is this, we have not intentionally built a country. What we must do is to begin to build an economy, digital economy, to governize and to properly interpret our constitution into personal attributes for Nigeria. We'll be building a system for us, and that first will now, um, will now, will now parachute into fostering security, fostering the economy, and ensuring that corruption does not exist. Corruption, corruption will forever exist in, a, in an organization without a system. So to me, that is the biggest challenge beyond every other challenge. We talk about education, we talk about hardship, we talk about unemployment. All this must be built on a particular system, which we don't have. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about education because you are a player in that sector. Uh, what's, what's your own uh, model for revamping the education system in Nigeria? Yeah, one, you know, uh, when you talk about education, many persons are focused on tertiary educational system, forgetting that there is a problem in the educational system holistically, right from the primary to the secondary to tertiary. Mm -hmm. We have lack of funding. Today, Nigerian government still budget less than 10% UNESCO benchmark for budget for education. We have less than 6.4%. You know, we need leaders who have value, who could rejig, who could revitalize, who could change the curriculum, who could ensure that Nigerians' mind are transformed. Education is not just giving certificate to people. It's transforming the mind of your citizen to be at par at global citizen or to compete better. We need Nigerians who would, in a few years from now, thinking of going to space. We need Nigeria who can solve the problem of Nigeria. And that can be done by investing massively in our education. You know, digitalizing the education. State like Zamfara has been, education has been shut down for three years because of insecurity. We can shut down school, yet education continues when we digitalize our system. When we say, oh, Nigerians are not digitally savvy, we are, we are not saying the truth. We now have young people in the village who operate their phone, who know how to go, who know how to go to their Facebook. You know, they're already there. We need to start investing. There is not too much money, too much for you to educate your people. If you believe education is too expensive, what we are doing in Nigeria, we are trying ignorance. That is why we end up providing the kind of leaders we have today. For me, we need to overhaul the total educational system. We need to encourage our teachers. We need to invest massively in Nigerians. We need to invest in research. Where is our research? In the university, research is supposed to be um, what's it called, the link between the industry and the school. We don't, even have, we don't even have research. In 2015, Nigeria will become a population of about 1 billion people. Who knows this? We Nigerians don't even know. We are, we are smart people. But if you check, many Nigerians, I'm sorry to say, don't have that required knowledge to begin to fix our problem. So we're going to invest. Then to tertiary education, I always say this, though many people find it very difficult to believe what I say, that the reason why we don't have strike in the primary and secondary sector in Nigeria today is because private sector are playing a huge percentage of that, of that sector. We have, we have about 80% private sector running that sector. Even to the extent that if government schools go on strike, it will be negligible. What we must do to tertiary education is the same thing. We must begin to engage more private sector in the Nigerian tertiary education. And what happens when you do that is that there will be competition, tuition fee will crash to the extent that you, some schools will start charging 
100,000, 70,000 as tuition fee. We have some private, some federal investors today that charge up to 100,000 naira. And yes, yeah, so if people are complaining, why do you want uh, private university? We cannot pay. Nigerians are poor. Once there's competition, price will drop. I know this. And that is, what, that is the model that helps education everywhere in the world. You do not monopolize an industry that is a national necessity for your people. So could that be why uh, ASU is um, able to hold the government to ransom? Yes, because we have 90% of Nigeria in government-owned universities. Mm. But you know, the president said recently that his administration has invested so much in education. I think over the past seven years, they've invested more than six trillion naira. But it appears as if uh, all of that, maybe some, some of it goes down the drain because of huge corruption in the education sector, especially in the tertiary education. It's not corruption. You, there is no system. When you don't have a system, corruption flies. We are here to the NTVC. Imagine if there's no system. Yeah. You know, when you are running a mono system, if you don't have a system, a mono organization, if you don't have a system, you can manually curtail. But once a system is, is multifaceted, you need a system to manage it. Corruption will continue to strive in Nigeria if we do not intentionally build a system around every activities, every function that we do as a nation. So we, it's not about investing huge trillion. What is the impact of it? So when you invest, it's just like crude oil today. When, they, when, when, they, when crude oil is being pumped from a particular terminal to another, you are sure of about 60% of above theft mm -hmm. on it. Mm -hmm. You know, we need to begin. That is the same thing that's happening. So when six trillion is being spent, believe me, it's not up to 500 billion that it's the ground. Because there's huge loopholes in the system. There's no system to monitor. There's no re-evaluation. There's no monitoring. And everybody is there to eat something for themselves. And what we get by so doing is we get Nigerians who are not educated. We get doctors who are quacks. We get engineers who cannot fix roads. We get every, every Nigerian will just be, and we will not be relying on expatriates to fix our country. Yeah. That is a country that is hedge. For doom. Mm. And we don't want that to happen. For us, it's not just by budgeting to education, it's by ensuring that a single cupboard that is budgeted to fix education is used to fix the problem. And you know, we have demonstrated that from our program of from the past, mm. giving scholarships to Nigeria, ensuring that Nigerians, even while ASU is on strike, are, are, are educated. A man that has that value, believe me, would sit to ensure that every cupboard that is budgeted to fix education is used in fixing education. Mm. One major problem the next president of Nigeria will inherit and will have to tackle will be the issue of um, oil theft because you know that the country relies so much heavily on revenue generated from the oil sector. But it appears as if a lot of these are now being um, frittered away uh, by the oil theft and activities of vandals and all of that. How do we diversify the economy to ensure that uh, the country's um, dependence on crude oil is largely reduced? Okay, number one, um, I've worked with the West African Renewable Energy Commission as a Secretary General, so I understand what is alternative energy. I understand sustainable energy. I understand green energy investment. Yes, we need to start looking at low carbon emission energy processes to ensure that Nigeria have alternative to energy so that we are dependent on crude oil will be minimal. But again, we, we produce crude oil. If we as a nation want to start reducing the burden of crude oil, it means that we are shutting we are shooting ourselves because we, we we need to export our we need to sell our crude oil. This is it. We have a little solution for that challenge. Who are the people stealing the crude oil? They are those engaged in illegal refinery. And many times we have advised government beyond giving license to modular refinery. We need to start looking at giving license to low scale refinery, refinery that are developed te with technology, our local technology. We need to start solving our problem by looking at our peculiarity as a nation. If we look at these militant guys, those guys who are stealing the oil, they have been able to create a local technology to steal crude and refine crude into blue gas, get diesel. Do you know that 70% of the diesel that we consume in this country are produced from the creek? That is why when the war into the creek started, you saw the price of diesel went up. That is it. So if we have that peculiar problem, how can we look at our problem and begin to solve it? We can begin to call these guys, monitor them, and force them to work in line. And we don't need to even export. We can start. See, even in the U.S., another country, there are some corruption that you need to localize, control it and manage it rather than fight it. Because if you fight corruption too much, you can kill the economy. But I'm not saying we shouldn't fight corruption. We can create a system around problems that are killing the economy, monitor it and make it not look not corrupt. 
That is so beyond just giving license to, to, to refineries and modular refineries. Even a modular refinery costs over $500 million. Mm. It's still huge. But we need to start looking at, oh, we have local technology to refine some of our crude. Can we call these guys? Can we look at their technology? Can we help them improve it so that their refinery process will be environmentally friendly? And they can also get license because the solution to solving permanently um, subsidy, solution to solving permanently um, oil theft is to encourage local production and look at refinery. Okay, some people will ask, does Professor Christopher Imumolen fancy his chances at the polls against political heavyweights like Ashiwa Jubolatin of the APC, Atiku Abubakar of the People's Democratic Party, and the emerg another emerging political force of the Labour Party, Peter Obi? You know, um, Nigeria knows that our problem is not natural um, disaster. Our problem are man-made problem. We created problem. And who are those that created a problem? Those who led us and those who are currently leading us. And who are those people? It is the two parties and affiliates. When we say two parties, those who have been in those parties, mm. even if they've left the other party, it's still the same problem. So if Nigeria can be analytical, not fantasizing, we should know that members of those parties, even those who have left the other party, are part of the problem. They cannot solve our problem. Any man that is affiliated, so the political set of those that create this problem cannot solve this problem, even if it's a saint. You know, so they know. I haven't known that we need a neutral leader. We need a leader, a leader that is coming out of, out of the political sphere, who is going to come in without affiliation to these people they should, and fix this should problem. Should we be looking at the parties now or the individuals and their capacity, competence, and character? Who, who is their friends? Who are the people that will lead with them? Who are their ministers? Is it not from that party? Those people that left those parties, who are their friends? Who are the people with them? It is an ideology. They are the same. We need a neutral person from the outside space to come in and solve this problem. Even if, for example, people watching does not agree, even if it takes 50 years, Nigeria will come to understand this. The man, the Messiah that will solve our problem, must not, one person cannot solve our problem. But it's a man that is not affiliated. Our problem, what is the cause of our problem? Now, so, much, so much problem. So one, let us leave out these major parties you have called. Nigeria should begin to look at other parties, we have 18 candidates, 18 managers, we have applied for this job. Check our CV, check our track record, check what we have been doing privately. So many of these people, once they lose election now, they have, they've traveled to London or Dubai or whatever, they come back after another four years. What have they been doing after governance? Some of them were governors, some of them were vice president. What, after they left, what have they been doing? That is very, very key. So if you are looking at competence and character, that is where you see it. Not people that will come up to say, when I was a governor, this is what I do. What did you do when you were not governor? That is the edge I have. I have done so much that many of them privately with private funds. Mm -hmm. And I've been doing this without any, if, I was not even thinking about politics. It's because of the value. Today, I own institutions, even in Ghana and other countries. I'm giving scholarship to other Africans in other countries. Will I ever become president in Ghana? Will I ever become president in Sierra Leone? I do this because of value for human life. If I'm given the opportunity, if I'm voted in, I believe I have a chance. I know I have a chance. All I need is to engage the Nigerian people to discover me and discover my ideology. And we have a long time to the election. We have about six months. So you, it might look very short, but you must know that since 1999, this is the longest campaign. Mm -hmm. Campaign has already been three months after primaries. We have six months. To me, it's a good time to engage. It's a good time for Nigeria to have revelation, to begin to know who is right for them. Yeah, but you know, prosecuting a presidential election is capital intensive and the candidates and their political parties would need a huge financial war chest. Are you able? Why, why am I here? We, we will try our best to use the fund we have logistically. I believe God will answer the Nigerian prayer. If we continue like this to say we must have money backs because when they invest this money back, they rip it back with your life, with your blood, your children will suffer. There will be insecurity. You will not have power to run a 24 hours economy. Is that where we want to go? So we, be, we need Nigeria, there's a revolution. I like what is happening on social media, but I believe what is happening on social media will eventually favor the right candidate. Okay. The, you are one of the uh, young presidential candidates that have uh, thrown their hearts in the ring. Uh, what is it the young people want? Because you know that this group of people will, to a large extent, determine whoever becomes the next president. What is it they want? One, you know, if you, if you truly follow, I know you are a political analyst, before this year, Nigerians have been clamoring for a young leader. Yes, and they have been clamoring for, we don't need from these two parties. So immediately some other person understood this. They migrate into other parties and they try to 
masquerade themselves to look like that person. What Nigerian youth need is Nigerian youth's voice need to be heard. Nigerian youth need to be sure that our inherent ability is totally tapped by a country. We have Nigerian youth who are resourceful. We have Nigerian youth who are innovative. We have Nigerian youth who are you know, who are, who, are so st who are so great, they're doing well all over the world. But we have a leader, we have a country that is not tapping the fullness of the potential of the Nigerian youth. Look at what is happening to terrorism and banditry. Who are those doing it? Is it not young Nigerians? Have you seen 50 years old person caught us? They are always between the age of 17 to 20 something years. If the youth of Nigeria can become a tool to destroy, then they are also the tool to develop our very own country. I'm the only youth in this race. You must know that. I'm not just one of the youngest. Youth, youth is once you are above a particular age, you are no more young. So I represent the voice of the youth in the political scene. I represent the voice of the youth in this presidential scene. Imagine if I'm not a candidate, the voice of the youth would be misplaced or would be missing in this race. Mm. So Nigerian youth need to, again, begin to analyze to properly ensure that they understand that this, our cardinal point, which we had some years ago, should remain our focal point in selecting who lead us. Is there a possibility of uh, some other parties uh, coming together to form a stronger and more formidable um, force that would maybe face the PDPs and the APCs? Yeah, I don't Is it possible for or would you support it? Now for me, eh, if, if Nigerians are, and I believe we've gotten to that stage where Nigerians are beginning to be very critical, about our situation. We are tired of the kind of country we are living in. We cannot have another eight years of you know, living too much in darkness and we begin to see a little and we believe we have light. Mm. There's huge problem. Nigerians are tired. There's no need for any formation. Any party now can decide who wins. I know people will be structured. You have this money, they will convince you and this. For me, I'm not looking at any alliance. I'm going into this race. I believe I'm going to win and I know I'm going to win this. Um, this particular election. So I don't know of other candidates. For Accord and for Professor Chris Momole, we are working strongly to fill the 176,000 polling units, to have our polling units agent, to have our structure all across. We're already having it. Mm -hmm. You know, you so many of you attended our primaries and you see, the, you, if you have been following me, you will know that we already build a salient structure all across Nigeria. Accord will become the party that is going to shock the Nigerian political space when it comes to next year election. Mm. And Nigerians can take that to the bank. They can. Okay, yeah. then. <clears throat> well, we'll take a quick break at this point. When we return, we'll continue with the rest of the program. Don't go away. <music> Welcome back. My guest is still the presidential candidate of Accord Party, Professor Chris Tova, Professor Christopher Emomolen. Thank you for staying with us, sir. Uh, Let's talk about our uh, health now. That is a very critical sector, and we um, know that uh, there, there, there's, a, there's a big issue in that sector because um, if you look at the infrastructure, it's dilapidated, and there's also not so much investment in the health sector. What's your own plan for that? You know, um, we it's, it's, it's been a very, uh, what's it called, a problem that has been there for too long yeah. that we do not value our health sector, we do not show concern because we have leaders who spend so much capital flight on traveling abroad to go to get themselves treated. Mm. One of the very things we are going to be doing is that Nigerians, especially those who are in the public office, mm. must patronize our healthcare services. Okay. Two, we must invest in human capital development of our medical professionals, mm. doctors, nurses, and the rest of them. It's very key. If we are going on strike in ASU, imagine the kind of doctors we are going to create in the next four years. So when ASU resume now, I'm sorry I'm going to the YouTuber, they're going to rush the doctors to take a course of one year in two months. Those are the doctors that will be there. Mm -hmm. One, before we talk about infrastructural dilapidation, let's talk about the human input, because it's very key. Then investment in it, there are so many. You know, we, we live in a country that does not have friendly investment environment. We need to start rejigging our investment policy. We need to encourage investors to come in. Nigeria is a huge market of over 200 million people. Mm -hmm. I can tell you that many international organizations that fly and come in around West African countries to set up their headquarters is actually eyeing the Nigerian market. But the purpose why, the reason why they are not coming to Nigeria is because of the challenges we have. But unfriendly um, business policies. There are some countries that give total tax waiver, tax exemption, tax holiday to encourage and attract investors. Mm -hmm to come in, even in the healthcare system. Are you aware that Nigerian visa 
is one of the hardest visa to get in China and the US for a country that needs investors. You're talking about health. Investors are one of the drivers of the economy. Who are the investors? Nigeria first, then foreign investors. If we are serious about rejigging our system, there are things that we must do. C countries like, um, I don't want to call it, start calling the nearby countries, have year of black return. They encourage investors massively into their country. We must begin to show uh, what's it called? sign that we are serious to build our economy. What we'll be doing in our time is to create an healthcare scheme that will make healthcare very affordable for Nigeria. And that starts by ensuring that we integrate all the hospitals, both national and private hospitals, into a single database yeah. so that every Nigerian that is giving birth to at part time is recognized, is known by the government. Yeah. And we are also going to ensure that we invest usually to ensure that the CGO political zone in Nigeria have affordable healthcare scheme. Yeah. You know, there's also this um, growing conversation ar around the rising cost of governance. How will you tackle this? Because people are beginning to say that resources are scarce, but it seems we still spend so much to run government. Yeah, you know, I said something. I said the major challenge with Nigeria is the system. Those are boiled down. And many people don't, really, when I talk about system, what, what does it mean by a system? I talk so because I have run digital organization. I've run organizations all over the world. For example, I can just with my phone know what is happening in my, comp my company in Costa Rica. You know, we need to build a system. So when you talk about cost of governance, cost of anything, when it's going so much high, because there is no monitoring, there is no system. If you build a system around, remember I'm saying this, and many leaders will not even agree because they are not even a digital leader. If you build a system around, you are going to cut the cost of everything to minimal. And you only spend for what is necessary, and you will cut it. Yes, people are going to fight you building that system because Nigeria has so long lived in a country without a system. So any man that wants to come to build that system to curtail and cut the wings of corrupt politicians, in quotes, yeah. is going to face a lot of challenges. But we know how to also navigate around that. Yeah. to build that system, to enforce it, and to implement it. All right, then. Thank you so much for your time on the program, Professor Christopher Emomole, presidential candidate of the Accord Party. Well, that's all we have time for on the program this week. Remember, democracy is based on conviction. There are extraordinary possibilities in ordinary people. My name is Femi Akonde. See you next time.